Welcome to the epic conclusion of our four-part mini-series on hypothesis testing. In our last video, we talked about collecting data and finally computing our first test statistic. In this case, the one sample z-test. This is an inferential statistic, one of many that we're going to learn in this video series. In this video, we get to make our final decision. We get to finally say, do we think NeuroIQ is effective at changing people's IQ scores or not? More broadly, we get to learn a little bit today about how we can evaluate our hypotheses in light of evidence. And when I say hypotheses, I'm referring specifically to the statistical hypotheses we set up at the very beginning. So, in order to make this decision, I have to introduce this last concept of a p-value. P-values are simply probability values, and it's the probability of finding the observed value or a value more extreme than what you observed if the null hypothesis is true. So this is, again, a jargony definition, but an extremely important one. P-values come up all the time in research, and if you read pretty much any published article, you're going to see P-values, and so it's important to be able to understand them. So, the probability of finding the observed or a more extreme value if the null is true. Remember, break it down when there's a lot of jargon. If the null hypothesis is true, this is akin to saying there's actually no effect in the world. So think back to the neuro IQ example. If we did this study, we give neuro IQ for uh, 30 days to a variety of people, and then we measure their IQ scores to see if we made a difference from the population average IQ of 100. We do that study, and let's say we get an average, let's say X bar, an average IQ score among the sample of people who took neuro IQ for 30 days of 150. Well, if the null is true and neuro IQ is actually entirely useless, think about how tiny the probability of finding this observed value is. Again, if there's no effect, it would be really rare to just randomly pick 15 people from the United States, for example, and have those 15 people have an average IQ of 150 taken together. That's really weird. That's really unlikely. And so as a result, we're going to get a tiny probability value of this happening. If instead we did this study and we got an average IQ score of, say, uh, like 101, right? This is very likely, even if the null is true, even if neuro IQ is totally useless, it's totally normal and expected to find average IQs around 100, and this value of 101 is very close to that. And the result is going to be a very large probability value. It's very likely that we'll find this if the null is true. So where do we get p-values from? Well, pretty much every statistical test you can run, like we've already done a z-test, for example, will give you a p-value. Now, you'll never really calculate this yourself. This is typically something derived via a software. A software will give it to you when you do your z-test. It'll give you the z and the p. So it's important to look for this because this comes from the test statistic, which again is a measure of the extremeness of your data and your observed value. But we like kind of transferring this, transforming this into a p-value because the p-value is interpreted the same way no matter what the test statistic actually is. A z-test, for example, deals with the z-test statistic, t-tests deal with the t-test statistic, ANOVAs deal with f, and all of these have kind of different standards for what's considered extreme and what's not. The p-value, in contrast, is interpreted the same way no matter what, and that's why we give it a gold star here. That's why that's what we use in order to really make these final decisions of do we think there's an effect or not. So let's go back to our z-test statistic. This is what we calculated before. So this is our 1.53. That's what z equals. If you plug this into a software, you would get p equals 0.126. So how do we interpret this p-value of 0.126? Well, remember, this p-value is a probability value, sort of a proportion or a percentage. I'm going to change it into a percentage just to make it slightly easier to talk about. So roughly, this value of 0.126 kind of rounds to 13%. So here's how we can understand this value of 13%. There's a 13% chance of finding this outcome, of finding a sample mean of 105.9, even if the null hypothesis is true. Said differently, even if neural IQ is totally ineffective and has no bearing whatsoever on people's IQ scores, we would expect to find something this extreme, a sample mean of 105.9, which is a little bit different than a, than a population mean, excuse me, of 100, we would expect to find that about 13% of the time. So how do we determine whether that 13% is good enough? Well, we compare our p-value to our alpha level, 
Remember that your alpha level is your standard of evidence, typically 0.05, determined by just standards and norms in your field. In psychology, almost always 0.05. So if alpha is your standard of evidence, your p-value is your evidence. And so it makes sense to make this kind of a comparison. So here's the rule. If your p-value is less than your alpha, you reject the null hypothesis, which is to say, we think there's an effect. Remember, break down the jargon. Rejecting the null hypothesis means you're rejecting the idea that there is no effect, which is again akin to saying we think there's an effect. If your p-value is greater than alpha, then you fail to reject the null. This one's even worse in terms of jargon, but think about it. We fail to reject the idea that there is no effect, meaning we think there is no effect. Again, we're kind of stuck with the jargon, so we're going to have to get used to that. So, going back to our data here, we had a p-value of 0.126 and an alpha level of 0.05. So what decision do we make? Is our p-value less than alpha or is it greater than alpha? Well, in this case, our p-value is greater than our alpha level. And so we would fail to reject the null. Here's the decision we would make. We would say that this result is not statistically significant. We would say that we don't think neuroIQ is really effective at changing people's IQ scores. Even though we had a little bit of a difference from the population mean of 100, that difference was not big enough. It was not extreme enough for us to be convinced. We're not going to go out and buy NeuroIQ. Said in the more jargony way, if the null hypothesis is true, that is, if NeuroIQ is totally ineffective, the result we found, the mean of 105.9, would occur reasonably often. It's not rare enough for us to be convinced or surprised. And so this is the final decision that we make.